Amen. I'm going to sing this out. Cause you are waiting, giving me 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Again, we thank you so much for this space, this time to come together as your children and the body of you, Christ. God, you are truly worthy of our praise this morning. We thank you so much. We worship you, God. And God, we thank you so much for keeping us, your children, and this congregation safe up to this point. And God, we, we thank you in advance for your continued safety. And we just ask that you continue that so that we can come here and we can lift you up in praise for all that you've done for us, for keeping us safe. Help us to be the beacons in the night, the light in this community, God. I love you so much. And see, you're holy and powerful and precious name. And I say amen. You may be seated.
But I did walk away from that experience with two very important lessons. The first one was never trust high school boys. Probably something my dad had been trying to teach me for a long time. <laughs> Finally got nailed in my head that day. Never trust high school boys. Um, and the second lesson, the one that we're going to focus on today, is that balance is important. Balance is important. And there's a reason, I learned that morning, there's a reason that the phrase thrown off balance exists. You don't want that to happen in your life because I can tell you from personal experience, you end up with bruises the size of, the size of your face all over your body. And, um, and so getting thrown off balance, you know, when we're living unbalanced lives, we may not have such obvious or or such immediate consequences as literally flying through the air. But it can be just as dangerous when our lives are off balance. And so today we're going to be coming to the last week of our study of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. For the, for the past five weeks, we've been walking through these letters that the Apostle John either wrote or spoke to someone else and they wrote. Um, to the infant church. And John wrote these letters in a time when Christianity was being harshly attacked. And now when I say Christianity was being harshly attacked, I don't necessarily mean the followers of Christianity. They weren't yet being attacked quite as much, but the actual doctrine of Christianity itself, the beliefs that we hold on to today, were under serious attack. And so, and so John wrote these letters to kind of solidify what we as Christians believe in, to kind of remind young Christians, hey, this is what the Bible says, this is what scripture teaches, this is who Jesus was. And so he solidifies Christianity, our beliefs, in these letters. And today, we're going to pick up in 2nd and 3rd John. And now, these two letters combined are less than 30 verses. They're so small, in fact, that they don't have any chapters. You just say 2 John verse 9 instead of 2 John chapter 1 verse 9, like we do with most other books of the Bible. They're pretty short chapters, and yet there's so much truth in these 30 verses. Um, so if you have your Bibles or your, or your devices and you want to follow along, we're going to start in 2 John 9 through 11, and then we're going to pick up or jump over to 3 John 9 through 10. So it should be nice and easy to remember. We're starting in verse 9 in both chapters. Or in both books, excuse me. So as you're turning there, let me, let me give you some context for this book of 2 John, the first eight verses. Um, so like I said, John was writing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John to a group of people who were still kind of trying to figure out what this Christianity thing was all about. And so he writes 2nd John so you're most likely a house church, whether it's, it's just a family who have kind of created a house church, or whether it's, you know, other people coming in and joining that family. But he's, he's writing to a house church who have experienced the goodness of Jesus. They've experienced the grace, the mercy of God. And they are so, so eager to share that goodness, that mercy, and that grace with everyone that they can. And so John writes this letter, and he starts out by commending them, by saying, you guys have done such good things. You know, you are opening your houses to strangers. You are, you are sharing love to everyone around you. You have shown faithfulness in all that you've done. I commend you for that. Well done. But then, then he gives us, he gives the, the house church and us too today a little bit of a warning. Because he says, he says, you guys have done such a good job sharing the love of Jesus that you've forgotten one important thing. And so this is where he starts his word of caution in uh, verse 9. He says, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. 
And so he starts off with these good things, saying, you guys have done so good, but you've forgotten this one thing. You see this church, this little house church, as small as they were, they had a huge heart. They had a heart for people who did not know Jesus. And they were so excited about the grace of God. But they forgot to balance that grace of God with the truth of God. And so they found themselves on the seesaw of grace and truth. And they found themselves leaning so far over to the side of grace that they actually found themselves in danger. Because they were so willing to open their hearts to anyone and everyone and listen to anyone and everyone that they lost their discernment. They wanted so badly to be hospitable that they were welcoming their homes to the wrong people for the right reasons. And they could no longer tell right from wrong. And so they found themselves in this really dangerous gray area they didn't balance grace and truth. They found themselves getting thrown off course, getting thrown off balance. And then in, in 3 John, we have almost the exact opposite problem. You see, 3 John was written to an individual, an individual who was probably a leader, a teacher, a preacher in another house church. And, and this individual, his name is Gaius, he finds himself struggling with this person named Diotrephes. And so John offers a little bit of advice about this difficult person named Diotrephes. And he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. I do love that phrase, malicious nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other people. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. So we have almost the exact opposite problem in 3 John. In 2 John, people found themselves so ready to welcome people that they were even welcoming heresy into their lives. And in 3 John, we have someone who has just completely thrown grace and truth out of the window. And he is, he is rejecting Everyone. He's rejecting the right people for the wrong reasons. And so, so he has just completely rejected the teaching of John. Now, if you remember, John had walked with Jesus. This is the same John who sat at Jesus' feet, the same one who called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And Diotrephes is reject rejecting the, the teaching of he has thrown truth out the window. And without that truth, he cannot have any grace. He's thrown the boat out the window. And it, it doesn't really take a leap of faith to believe that if he was this willing to reject John, that he would then reject the one who sent John, which was Jesus himself. And so Diotrephes finds himself in this place where he has thrown grace and truth out the window. He is so caught up in his own pride, in his own selfishness, that he is blinded to the truth of Jesus. And friends, this is a dangerous thing because unless there is a change of heart that we don't get to know about, unless there's a change of heart that happened after this letter was written, Diotrephes has condemned himself. He has condemned himself. And so that's why it's, why it's so dangerous to live without a balance of grace and truth. We need the truth of Jesus. We need to understand that without Jesus, we are sinners in need of mercy. But then on the other hand, we also have to understand that because of Jesus, we have been given more mercy, more grace than we ever could have imagined. We need both sides because one You know, we talked about how the early church was getting tempted on every side. They were getting attacked. Their beliefs were getting attacked. Who they were as a church, their identity as a young church was getting attacked. 
And, and the reality is we really don't have that much different of a situation today. That was a terrible sentence grammatically, but, <laughs> but I hope you get the point of what I'm trying to say. There's really not a lot of difference between the dangers that the young church was facing and the dangers that we face today. Just like how way back when, 2,000 years ago, the, the beliefs of Christianity were under attack. Today, we are, we are called every day, we are challenged. You know, what do we believe in? How are we going to live that out? Are we really living out the truth of Scripture? And so it is just as tempting today to lean too far either, either towards a false grace or to lean too far towards a false truth. And I say false, you know, a false truth and a false grace, because either one without the other is only a half truth. Grace without truth is dangerous because it allows us to become false peacemakers. Grace without truth allows us to, to not stand up for ourselves, to not stand up for our faith, to not... Um, to not speak out when we see something wrong because we're trying to just be the peacemaker. You know, we're trying to just be the one that everybody likes because that's what we think Jesus has called us to do. And so we're just trying to, to let, you know, we let people walk over us and, and because we think that that's what Jesus would want us to do. And But, but becoming a doormat is not grace. Becoming a doormat is not helpful. It's not helpful for you. It's not helpful for me. It's not helpful for the people in our lives. Because the reality is, when we don't stand up for what we believe, we are condemning those around us. You know, if you see a, a semi-truck heading towards your friend, you better do all you can to warn them, to jump in front of them, to pull them to safety. And when we live without truth in our lives, when we, when we err so far to the side of grace, that we forget about truth, then it's just like we do nothing when that semi truck comes. And then on the other hand, when we lean too far to what we think is truth and we forget about grace, then we become these harsh, you know, harsh, bitter people. When all we remember is that we are sinners and that the people around us are sinners, and when we start holding ourselves and others to impossible standards. Then we just become these harsh, irrelevant people. We become people who, who don't reflect the goodness of God. We become, we become people who, who make others wonder, why would I want to be a Christian? If that's what Christianity is, why would I want any part of that? And so either way, it's just as dangerous. You know, when, when we hold too hard to truth, we forget that Jesus came for sinners. That the pursuit of holiness is an honorable pursuit and something that we are all a part of. But it's an ongoing process. It's a journey. And as a journey, it has setbacks. It has mistakes. It has wrong turns. And so we need truth and grace so that we don't become burned out, discouraged. So we don't give up. So we need them both. And, and the, the beauty of the gospel is that God has something so much better in store for us than just this constant battle between grace and truth. And when we learn to reconcile the two, when we learn to balance the two, instead of leaning one way or the other, but when we find the middle path, there is joy. There is joy to be found when we balance truth and grace. You see, truth allows us to stand firm in our faith. Truth gives grace a backbone. It allows us to stand firm, to be confident in what we believe in, and listen to other points of view. It allows us to listen to people that we disagree with, because we know the truth, and we can have conversations with people while still staying true to Scripture, still staying true to what we know to be right. And then grace, on the other hand, allows us to extend a hand to the hurting. It allows us to, to make mistakes. It allows us to give grace to those around us when they make mistakes. And when we find balance between the two, then we get to live lives that allow for imperfection in both ourselves and others, that allow for imperfection without compromising who we remain to be. 
So as we close this morning, I just want us to take a few minutes of reflection. I just want us to think about, you know, look back over this past week. Imagine with me, if you will, that you have your own seesaw, hopefully not around in high school boys, but you have your own seesaw and you have two buckets on it. And one bucket is where all of the truth that you made this week. On the other bucket is all of the grace that you gave this week. Which bucket fills up do you tend to lean more towards giving grace to letting people walk over you, to letting people, you know, get away with things that maybe they shouldn't get away with? Or, or do you tend to lean more towards truth to, to calling people out without offering, you know, to, to calling people out on their sins without offering weight on their sins? Do you tend to lean more towards a harshness, a bitterness towards those that disagree with you? And, and some of us are going to lean more one way, some of us are going to be lean more towards the other. But I just want us to think, to reflect, which one, which bucket fills up first in my life? The truth is there's only one person in all of history, you know who it was, there's only one person in all of history who has been able to perfectly balance grace and truth. You know, when Jesus walked this earth, he was always, always, and even now, as he, as he reigns in heaven, he is still balancing the two. You know, he, he was not ashamed to say, he never ran away from the fact that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And without me, there is no way into heaven. He never shied from that fact, even when it was life and death. He never shied away from that fact, that truth. And yet, at the same time, every time he came in contact with Every time he had the opportunity to show grace, to show love, to show mercy, he took it. In fact, not just the opportunities were presented to him, but he went out of his way to show grace, to show mercy. He went out of his way to meet with people who were different than him. He went out of his way to meet with people that the religious leaders condemned him for. He went out of his way to meet with people who were, who were considered nothing. Nothing at all. Their lives meant nothing. Their souls meant nothing to the people around them. But to Jesus, they were everything. He went out of his way to show grace and yet never shied away from the truth of who he was. And so he, he was the perfect example of how to balance grace and truth. And so this morning, as we come to a close, as we close out our study of John's letters, we are presented with an opportunity. Are we going to be like the church in 2 John? The church that, that leans so far towards grace that we forget about truth, that we lose discernment, that we accept any and every teaching that we receive? Or are we going to be so, are we going to be like that Atreides who, who threw them both out the window? And are we, are we just going to be so caught up in our own pride, in our own way, in our own selfishness, that we lose both grace and truth? Or are we going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Are we going to fight, even though it's hard, even though we're going to make mistakes, even though sometimes we're going to lean one way or the other, but every day we can make the choice to say, today I'm going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Today I'm going to try through the Holy Spirit
And so as we close again, I want us to reflect. I want us to take a moment and just be honest with ourselves. Look back over this past week. Look, look forward to maybe some opportunities you have in the week to come. Maybe you know that there's a difficult conversation coming up. Maybe you know that there's a difficult, a difficult person in your life that you're going to have to deal with this week. And, and you tend to lean more towards one side or the other. You either let them walk all over you or you tend to bulldoze them. And, and, and maybe as you prepare to deal with that person this week, spend some time right now reflecting, praying, asking God for the power of the Holy Spirit to make itself known in you. And if you would, bow your heads and we're going to go to the Lord and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, as, as we close out this series on letters of John. Lord, you have, um, you have given us these letters to remind us the truth of who you are, the truth that, that you are good and that you call us to be good, that you call us to be radiant, that, that just like Jared said, that you call us to be beacons in the darkness. And Lord, as a part of being with that beacon in the darkness, Lord, we get to be these people who, who are so confident in what we believe in, while at the same time showing grace to those who don't yet believe as we do. And Lord, so I pray that I can close out the series and as we send this, this group out today, that you would, you would just start this awakening within us, this awakening that allows us to, to balance truth and grace, and, and to find that balance, to find the joy in the middle of the two. Lord, I pray that you would that you would bless this people. No matter what no matter what we're going through this week, that that your blessing would just be on them. That we would be able to experience you in incredible ways as we leave today. And that we would have meetings with you throughout the week where we are confident that you are with us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work in our lives that the power of the Spirit would, would just continue to renew us from the inside out. Lord, we love you. We worship you. It's in your holy name.